Hello, everyone. Welcome to True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. I'm Andrew. And I'm Reverend Kosho Finch. So we're on episode 18, and this time we wanted to talk about some of the expectations versus reality of uh, Buddhist retreats and training. Yeah, I think it's a good topic. Actually, it came up recently um, with people interested in going on retreats, and I get questions often, people asking me about which one is better and um, what to expect, and I think my answer is usually quite surprising to them. Um, so my experience, people often look at retreats as sort of a uh, good way to relax or a, uh, almost a spa experience. Um and may not have a good understanding of the purpose and the design. So maybe this is a good time to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And actually, being in a retreat was the reason why I haven't been on the recent episodes. Um, I was in a monastery for uh, roughly a month, Um, but I'm finished with that now, and I can come back and join for a few more episodes. Welcome back. (laughs) So um, you were in for, you said, just about a month, and I know for your retreat, you probably had a good idea of what to expect, but maybe some of the other participants, um, maybe a little bit difficult for them? Yeah, so this definitely wasn't my first rodeo. Um, I've been in many retreats before, uh, and this time uh, I was staffing in it, so it wasn't like... I had no idea what was going on, but nevertheless, I think each time a retreat is held, um, the participants, um, the surrounding conditions in it change the experience of the retreat. So I think there's always more to gain if people think, is one retreat enough? Should I go back? I would say always. There's always more to learn from them. Mm, I would agree. I think, um, for example, when I was in Japan, um, most of the temples on Koyasan support themselves um, by hosting guests. So they act, um, I guess in an American context, you would think of a bed and breakfast. So our job um, is to clean the rooms, prepare the um, beds, um, bring the people food. Um, you know, there's a, quite a bit of service involved. So most of the day um, is, is working in that fashion, uh, cleaning, um, there's a certain set of, of folks um, who cook, not me. I didn't have the, the quite the skills to prepare the food that uh, everyone expected to get, um, and uh, just quite quite a bit of service uh, to guests. So part of that practice, of course, was um, just like probably the hospitality industry. Um, not all guests were polite, so part of our practice is to accept that. Uh, that reality and um, you know what people are putting out, but I found that even when people came as guests, when it wasn't a retreat, um, their expectation of what it would be like or um, what they assumed living in a monastery or temple would be like was uh, quite didn't quite match the reality. So there was a lot of a lot of dealing with uh, surprise people. I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So. I think in my experience, um, the first time that I did these longer retreats, uh, there were a lot of participants who came in and uh, didn't make it through the entire time uh, because when they had applied, they were thinking that, you know, they would be living in a monastery, but other than that, the schedule would be up to them. They could do meditation, they could walk in the courtyard. Um, and kind of design their own schedules. But really, once we all got there, the schedule was really rigid. You Mm -hmm. had your um, morning meditation or morning chanting. Um, You had mandatory meals, breakfast and noon, where we would make offerings uh, to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, so that was required as well. You had a number of required classes a day, some study time at night. And by the time we ended up going back to the dorms, everybody was totally exhausted. <laughs> I think that's pretty, uh, probably for uh, that retreat, um, which I think yours was for young adults, um, is pretty common um, for most monastic environments. It tends to be very uh, rigid, um, a set amount of time to eat, um, a set time for everything. Um, so I, I guess that the best comparator would be the military, 
um, <laughs> or as my teacher used to say, um, it's like prison. He goes, you don't get the opportunity to uh, uh, choose what you eat, you know, when you eat, you know, who you uh, spend time with or who your cellmate was. Um, so he actually used to go and teach uh, at a prison in, in California. He taught meditation there. So the prisoners would always say, well, you don't know what it's like. And he said, oh, no, no, it's just like the monastery, you know. So he would say, this is what the monastery is like. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's the same. <laughs> um, but the thing he pointed out to them was uh, it's a good opportunity to work on your karma, you know, whatever brought you there. Um, here's a good opportunity to, to look at that because you are opting in to a structure where um, it's less focus on, you know, your what you want to do at every moment and a structure that is built to help you learn something or understand something. Um, and the structure itself is designed to be transformative, but obviously it can be uncomfortable at times, but um, hopefully not as uncomfortable as prison. I don't, I don't think it's quite as bad. <laughs> so mm-hmm. in the... Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. So I think actually um, in this year's retreat and in previous years as well, people have compared it to many things, including boot camp. So we thought about calling it Buddhist boot camp. Um, <laughs> that hasn't gone through yet, but, you know, it's still a joke. Uh, and then the other one is actually a prison. Um, also an orphanage <laughs> or a psych ward, but, you know. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very interesting to me, though, because I think part of the really great aspects of retreats like this is the uncomfortableness that it makes us feel. Because for me, the greatest lessons I learned during the month or six weeks that I spent there was in being uncomfortable and thinking about why something so simple puts me on edge. Mm -hmm. For example, being forced to wait in line um, for virtually any activity before we could move together as a group or why we had to wear the exact same uniform every single day. Very simple things after a few weeks become not so simple and tiny anymore. And it was a really good opportunity to look at really what my own afflictions were and what they were manifesting as. I think that's probably a really good... Um, when you when you mentioned uh, waiting in line, I remember... So we're both only children. Um I remember growing up, I never had to wait in line for food. And then um, when I had a good friend in grade school, and I think there were four children, five children in the family. So when we went to their house, uh, everyone had to get their plate and line up, and the mother would serve, you know, a set portion. And I never had this experience before, and I remember thinking, this is very odd. Why, why can't we just eat? And then you give a portion, and I thought, but I'm hungrier than that. I want more. But I, she looked very stern, so I was afraid to say anything. <laughs> and then I didn't have that experience again until, uh, you know, being in the temple and having to wait um, for food to be served, having no input on what it was. And then I remember that time and realized, oh, you know, I'd never had uh, the experience. And so it was very uh, jarring. And, um, you know, realizing, of course, at that point, all the things it was meant to teach me, but uh, recognizing that, um, you know, that was a an indulgence I think I'd had my my entire life up to that point was you know being able to choose you know sometimes even when I wanted to eat um definitely the proportions and uh how much of this or that um because there was not competition there was only only my plate had to be filled so um I think the temple a lot of things are um meant especially um in Japanese temples part of the idea is you're going to be in service to others. And so everything is meant to change your focus from your own comfort to uh, the comfort and service of, of other people. So it, it seems sort of paradoxical. I think a lot of Westerners would come um, and expect the monastics to be um, aloof and away from everyone. And especially in those temples that um, take guests, it's, it's the opposite. They're running up and down the hall, and the entire, all of the energy is focused on serving the guests. Um, and it's a, it really turns uh, the tables on people. And sometimes people don't actually understand the purpose of that training, so they, they think, oh, okay, the, again, it's all about my comfort as a guest, uh, not seeing that, you know, there's actually people here training to, you know, change their focus. 
Yeah, and I think um, it was very similar for my experience. Uh, I didn't stay at a monastery that operates as a bed and breakfast, but definitely uh, the temple has a lot of visitors. And so uh, we would do the dishes uh, after each meal, and we're talking hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of diners every meal. So it was a really good way of giving back to the community. Yeah, I think that's probably um, the part that maybe sometimes people miss. I, that was a question I got all the time, too. Um, well, why do you cut your hair? And I said, well, from a practical standpoint, it's a lot faster because we don't have as much time to bathe as the guests. Um, and people were uh, always got a lot of questions. Um, Temple we stayed at generally um, got a lot of foreign guests, too. So it was a good opportunity for people to... You know, everything they always wanted to know about Buddhism and Buddhist life, they got a chance to um, to ask. But uh, I think I had the some misconceptions myself before I went. Um, probably my closest connection or introduction to um, a Japanese temple or monastery was the the old cartoon Ikusan. Um, oh, and oh, okay. Besides watching them run up and down the, the floor uh, cleaning or doing laundry, um, it looked like they had a pretty good time, uh, <laughs> so uh, that was probably the only, um, for our listeners, you can find EQ san on YouTube, I think now, at least the introduction uh, cartoon. So um, there was the uh, only, you know, only example that I had seen. Um, so a, a, a lot of the aspects in terms of what, um, you know, a retreat would be like, are completely different um, in the West. I, if I read Buddhist magazines, and uh, in the back there's some advertisement for a retreat, and they're you know featuring the finest locally grown cuisine in this area and specific chef, and you know you can choose the type of room you get and the comfort levels and all these things. It it really the menu reads more like a hotel or resort, um, and I think that's okay. Um, but I think the traditional model is a little bit more structured. It's probably a better way to better way to put it. I think definitely the traditional model is very structured, and it depends. I'm hesitant to say that one is um, ultimately better than another, but I think it's really what the individual is looking for. Um, if they're looking for a very transformatory experience. Uh, then definitely I would suggest going to a traditional structured lifestyle and that will really push the individual, the practitioner, to the extent of their what they thought were their limits. And it's really inspiring to see how very little things become very big afflictions and being able to have the tools to deal with those as well while you're studying and practicing Buddhism. I think the more, um, as you call, uh, hotel style or resort style um, retreats definitely are very good for rest and relaxation, um, mm -hmm. rejuvenation, sort of. If you feel re very drained, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going to a monastery because that just might drain you a bit even more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's really dependent on what the practitioner is looking for in terms of their practice at that time. That's true. Um, so I, I definitely, um, I, I would agree. I think there's been some where people go because um, they have something that they need to do, um, writing, poetry, um, something they they need to reflect on, a, a big life change, and they're actually looking for a uh, quiet place with maybe some structure or purpose, but they need a literally a retreat from from the world. But uh, I would encourage people to seek out uh, the more traditional ones as well. Um, at least, uh, you know, some kind of temple stay, um, specific retreat, some kind of time frame. Um, of course, my focus is ease into it. If you if you go into a six month or you know three year retreat, you know, as the first step, that may be too much all at one time. But um, it's it's a good example of um, how to find the things you thought you were good at or areas you thought you had fixed or um, parts of your life you thought you had overcome, the retreat will um, teach you whether or not that's the case and give you time to um, reflect. It, I think it more naturally 
brings those things up to the surface. That was my experience. So um, my experience was things that I thought I had overcome years before. I saw oh, they're still there. Um, little annoyances. So as a, a Westerner and a, a all Asian group and thinking, uh, oh, I'm, I'm over some of my angst or um, uh, distrust of chanting or you know some of the things that I had in, initially. I saw, no, that's still there, um, and it was still an optical. So it was a really good uh, opportunity to see where um, you, your natural human self-delusion sets in and maybe what areas have actually been worked on and what areas still need work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So when I had gone, what is this now? This was probably two years ago. One of my classmates um, had assumed that he had already gone through all of his uh, issues with anger and that he was past that obstacle. But towards the end of the retreat, he realized quite suddenly that, no, it never really went away. Um, he had just been in environments where it didn't pop up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's really something that I think is important about the retreat. It's there, and it really depends on if the person is ready. Um, so, for example, uh, if someone is struggling with a lot of issues with at that moment, I would say to take the time to go through those issues first. I think in some cases the retreat will help, in some cases the retreat might not because it's so rigid and it's so demanding. Um, but I think if a practitioner is at the stage where practice is going well, I think I'm doing really good jump into a retreat and it will show you that you have many, many more steps to go. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's good about a retreat is if you get to do a practice for uh, an extended period, then when you come back, um, that practice is a little bit more cemented in you. So whether there be uh, chanting, mantra practice, meditation. Um, I led a retreat in a few years ago, and every morning there was meditation, and at the very beginning... The uh, practitioners were very uh, resistant. Nobody wanted to get up at that that hour. Uh, there was a lot of huffing and puffing and sighing and and you know angry looks and um, even some would protest and just lay down and and use the meditation cushion as a pillow. <laughs> and by the end, it was you know even just two weeks. I remember three days before the end, people started to cry in the morning, saying how much they were going to miss that practice and. Uh, you know how much it had changed them, so I I thought it had been a complete failure, but actually by the end it had been very successful, and I still get uh, contact from some of the people saying you know they still meditate every morning for that period of time, and that it's completely changed their life and the way they see, you know, what they do in the world and how they interact with other people. So um, sometimes being I don't want to I hate I say to use the word push, but maybe it's just again the, the having the structure where um, you know that there's something you, you have to do every day um, is very helpful because it starts to create a new, um, how can I say, maybe like a new habit um, that's more helpful than our old habits, which are really undermining a lot of what we're trying to do with Buddhist practice. So I think that um, that was probably one of my uh, best insights of you know watching people who, perhaps were not, uh, didn't know what they were getting into, but still benefited nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, I think with any retreat, there's always um, sort of a three-step process that comes along with it. So I think the first part of the retreat um, is always very uh, smooth because everybody is new to the temple. They're trying their best to adjust to the lifestyle there, um, taking everything in, trying to accept everything, and they're still... Um, very alert in that sense and are able to take everything in. Once we get to the middle of the retreat, though, um, it becomes very exhausting. People get tired of the lifestyle. A lot of complaints start coming out. And then a lot of um, negative emotions arise. And I think that this is always very normal. And essentially every year I've done a retreat, this has happened. So after all of those come up, though, I think in this sort of environment where everybody is practicing, they're able to find resolutions to those issues, whether on their own or 
with the help of a teacher or their classmates, and then by the end of the retreat, go back to that serene mode of this is really nice again. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think the most important step in that is that hump where it's very difficult. It's become really challenging for the individual. And then after they go over that, it's like, it's like the Zen saying, um, before practicing Buddhism, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Um, after we start practicing Buddhism, mountains are no longer mountains and rivers are no longer rivers. But then after practicing for a long time, mountains are mountains again and rivers are rivers again. But the perspective mm-hmm. in that is different. Completely different, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I know, I think that's a really good uh, a good example. I think a lot of the people who uh, came on our retreat a few years ago, that was uh, that was very much their their experience. Um, even when I was living, uh, in the temple, I remember I was in, you know, the temple for several months and then I had to go down to Tokyo for a visit. And, um, initially it was like, Oh, finally I'm away. Um, and then after about a day, it was like, you know, gosh, there's so much noise I never noticed before. And, um, so much hustle and bustle and, um, rudeness and and indifference. Um, and then when I got back, it was, um, seeing the temple in a completely different way as well. Um, so all of those, I think all of those perspectives are good because the one thing we can say about daily life is um, it eventually becomes so routine that we stop uh, having gratitude for it. We stop really, you know, noticing little things or having appreciation for little things. Um, and you know, one of the tendencies I think is that people start to accumulate more and more things to make daily life um, more meaningful. And what I've heard from people is oftentimes after retreats, they have a, a deeper appreciation for the things they had. They find a natural inclination towards uh, minimization. Um, one of the women who was on the retreat uh, ended up, I think, living in a barn the rest of the summer. And I was very happy um, with that arrangement <laughs> and found it just to be the most um, uh, freeing and natural thing rather than, you know, kind of a hardship, uh, issue because that, you know, their house was under reconstruction. Um, and actually it was just felt, you know, very light in her spirit and, uh, and happy. So it can definitely has, a, I think, potential to change our outlook on things. And if, if anything, I, I would say that that's, um, one of the, the best, probably lasting, um, you know, day to day aspects of a retreat. And, Especially on uh, in Japan, Koyasan, sometimes you know you'll see the um, monastic students going from place to place doing a pilgrimage around the city, and they actually um, are wearing geta, the wooden clogs, and they they run as a group from from place to place. Um, so they pray in one place and they take off running uh, in their robes. So it's quite uh, quite interesting to watch. Actually, um, I've done it. It's very hard to run. Anyway, in robes, it's very hard to do it, even harder to do it in Geta. <laughs> um, but some people say, well, it's like a paramilitary training. Um, and they think, oh, that's not good, or why is it so difficult? Um, you know, actually, it's, it's meant to, you know, really instill in people, um, you know, working as a group, working together, not wasting time, um, and not, you know, really taking away all of the daydream time. So you stay really focused on uh, on your practice. If you try to run, or you know, if you're huffing and puffing a little bit, and um, you know your your urge to uh, you know not waste time, it it also changes your your perception of time. Um, I often you know hear people say, "I don't have time for that," or "I don't have time for this," um, and it's not always the case. It's sometimes the case that we aren't managing time well. We don't we don't see the passage of time or the little ways that we use time. Um, so I think definitely in my case afterwards, um, I found suddenly I had more time. I I found time everywhere that I didn't see before. Uh, and that was really, uh, helpful. I felt like, oh, my life has gotten, uh, longer. I've had more life now. Um, so that was another, at least insight that I had. Maybe, maybe that was just unusual for my, my part. (laughs) I think for me, it wasn't the time. Mm Mm-hmm that um, I became more aware of it was the things in life like you were saying Um, because during the retreat I only have so many possessions 
And that's sort of a habit that I took away from the retreat. I only really carry around so much clothes because any more than that is just extra. Um, and really, it's kind of led me to see that I don't need to have that many things in life. I can really live happily on all of the basic necessities. Um, a bowl, some utensils, uh, some clothes, and toiletries. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, since I am still in school, I need a laptop. But other than that, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's it very is. easy to travel like that. It is. It is easy to travel, um, easier to move, easier to, to manage. I think sometimes we become overwhelmed with our with our stuff. Um, and I think definitely that environment or those experiences help us see, you know, what's necessary and what isn't, um, you know, what we need versus what we want. Um, so all of those, those are definitely good perspectives to take away. Um, maybe not so good for our economy, but overall better for the person. <laughs> uh, so I think, you know, if someone's looking to find a retreat um, and they're interested in, in doing something like that, at least some of my recommendations would be, you know, find something that um, is someone has done it before. Maybe there's it's been established, or they're bringing a model uh, from uh, some historical source. Of, you know, there's a tradition of doing that. I've seen a lot of retreats advertised, and in many ways they're themed, and that's not bad. But um, maybe ask yourself if if it really matches your your goals or um, if it appears to match uh, Buddhist practice and then um, you know ensure that the length of the retreat is um, you know doable for you if it's a one week three day um, ensure that you actually have that, that time off I saw a lot of people come into the temple and you know have to leave early because something came up because they really had overextended or overestimated the amount of time they have so um you want to make sure that you're not engineering in a uh, potential failure or um, some outside stress. And um, then the other ones I've seen is where there is um, complete silence for the entire time. And while that may be good for a portion, I think there needs to be someone available uh, to talk to or debrief um, regarding your experiences in retreat, um, some, some sharing time, uh, something along those lines. For many people who are especially new to meditation, um, there needs to be tweaks to their, their practice. Um, something may come up that's either emotionally difficult or, um, you know, sometimes even physical pain or, you know, adjustments need to be made. So I think they need to ensure that there's someone available to address those changes and, um, you know who's actually qualified to to handle those um, those issues. Um, so I, I think those are some basic things to look for. Mm -hmm. Did you have any any insights from um, people who went on retreat and things that they probably weren't aware of or should have been aware of or maybe didn't read the brochure close enough? <laughs> I think really the structure and the lifestyle of the retreat is what shocks most people um, because it's completely different from the conception that we have in mind here in the US. Um, a lot of times, like you said earlier in the podcast, we think that it's very free, it's very, we're just staying at a temple kind of um, retreat, but really it's all structured. Um, some of the pitfalls that I've seen though is, like you said, engineering failure into the retreat by uh, taking time off that you don't have. So mm -hmm. that's something that us as modern people um, are constantly uh, stuck in. We have a lot of responsibilities, whether that be school or work or family, and it can be really hard to find that time. So I think in those cases, perhaps starting with a one day or a weekend retreat, two, three days, maybe extend that to a week if you feel um, like you have that time, you can take that off and you're ready. Um, and especially for the longer ones, it takes a lot of advanced planning. Uh, for example, six weeks, how are you going to keep the bills paid for those six weeks? Are you going to have somewhere to go back to after six weeks? Mm -hmm. And even that, six weeks was pretty hard for some of my classmates. Uh, for me, it was just part of a summer vacation. 
but eventually when you get into the even longer ones, one year, two years, three years, do you have anything to come back to? And if you have to come back early, what are you going to do? So I think all of these things are things that people who are considering extended retreats definitely need to consider. I would agree. I see it even in um, smaller examples where, um, so we, we ran a mini retreat at the temple over the weekend and uh, there's, you know, even though it's only three quarters of a day or we did it in, in two sessions, so, you know, a few hours and then a second block of a few hours. Um, even if it's short, sometimes people say, well, I have to keep my phone with me. I have to keep my phone on. I have to, you know, watch for a call <clears throat> or a text message from a, a child or <clears throat> some other family member. And I would recommend, you know, even for that short period of time, um, if that portion of your attention is going to be on, you know, on the cell phone or the, the, the email or something like that, um, maybe it's not a good time to do the retreat or arrange for that person to have someone else to call so that you can be undisturbed during that time. Um, so you sort of engineered into the retreat, you know, a percentage of your attention that's going to be outside the retreat. Then um, I think a lot of times people are engineering obstacles into the retreat that, that don't need to be there. Um, so those are the recommendations. People just, you know, give some attention in advance to um, knowing that, there will be some aspects of a retreat that will be uncomfortable and it's supposed to be that way. Um, but you know, not to make it more so, um, nothing is, most of these retreats are based on practices that <clears throat> been around for a long time. So I, there's some, um, logic built in to why they are the way they are. And, um, we can benefit from them even if we don't immediately understand it. So those would be the, uh, you know, recommendations I would have is, you know, don't, you know, don't undermine it, uh, on purpose from the, from the, from the get go. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I think that will wrap up today's episode. Was there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, just uh happy 4th of July to every listener. And, um, you know, hopefully everyone had a, um, fun and enjoyable holiday and of course safe and then uh, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time alright thank you sensei thank you <laughs>